My name is Charles Prober from Stanford University, and I'm going to speak about herpes simplex viruses, specifically about the microbiology and pathogenesis of HSV. My specific learning objectives uh, for you is that you are able to recall the microbiologic characteristics of HSV and to explain the pathogenesis of infections caused by HSV both those that are primary and those that are reactivated. I'll explain those terms. This is our human pathogen map, and for this video, I'm focusing on, of course, viruses, and most specifically, I'm focusing on the DNA viruses, and very specifically, on herpes simplex virus. This is our phylogenetic view of viruses, showing RNA viruses that are single-stranded, uh, RNA viruses positively stranded, um, double-stranded RNA viruses and retroviruses, and today I'm focusing on double-stranded DNA viruses, specifically those within the herpes virus family, of which there are eight members. And the two that are relevant to this video are HSV-1 and HSV-2. These two viruses, HSV1 and HSV2, along with VZV, are part of the alpha subfamily of herpes viruses. There are also uh, beta subfamily and gamma subfamily. And the distinguishing characteristics of these subfamilies are shown in this table. Uh, for today, I simply want to focus on the alpha viruses as represented by HSV1, HSV2, and VZV. These viruses have a short reproductive cycle, that is, they replicate quickly. As they replicate within a cell, they efficiently destroy the cell, and they then rapidly spread from cell to cell, or if in viral culture, they spread quickly in the viral culture. Another very important distinguishing feature of the alpha viruses is their ability to establish latency in sensory ganglia. The herpes viruses, as depicted in this schematic, are enveloped. There's a uh, lipid uh, envelope around the virus, and stuck within this lipid envelope are a number of surface glycoproteins that are uh, named by the alphabet, glycoprotein A, glycoprotein B, and so forth. One of the glycoproteins, glycoprotein G, uh, is especially important, as I'll mention in a moment. Uh, there are two serotypes of the herpes virus, as I've already said, HSV1 and HSV2, and these serotypes have extensive genetic homology. They look very much alike. However, one distinguishing feature is the surface glycoprotein G that I referenced, and this becomes important in serologically testing for HSV1 versus HSV2. The other picture on this slide is that of an electron micrograph of an HSV virus. There's some key terms that are uh, important to understand as I discuss herpes pathogenesis. A primary infection is an infection, as it sounds like, that a person is seeing for the first time. It's the first experience with that specific virus. A latent infection refers to the persistence of the virus, but in a non-replicating state. It's hibernating. A reactivated infection refers to the virus coming out of latency, renewing its replication, and then being able to spread uh, from person to person. Symptomatic infections are those that are associated with clinical signs and symptoms. And asymptomatic infections, which are very common with herpes virus, refers to viral infections as evidenced by viral shedding, but no signs or symptoms of infection. Remembering our map that depicts microbiology and immunology and the interface that results in the patient experiencing clinical disease, I'd like to re reference how the virus, herpes virus, enters the cell. It does this by direct, intimate contact, by the juxtaposition of skin and mucous membranes between two humans. Often it's facilitated because the skin might be slightly abraded or damaged. Once the virus enters the skin or mucosa, it replicates, it reproduces at the entry site, 
and then it is then it is transported up the neurons to regional ganglia. HSV1 is transmitted to the trigeminal ganglia as depicted on the schematic. HSV2 is transmitted to the sacral ganglia. After the virus gets to the ganglia, it begins to establish latency. It then returns back to, along the neuronal pathways, back to the initial site of inoculation. It replicates further, and a visible lesion, a vesicle, erupts at the surface, on the skin or on the mucosa. If one were to biopsy these vesicles, one would see evidence of multinucleated giant cells and intranuclear inclusions, as shown on this schematic, consistent with an HSV infection. So going from the skin to the ganglia, the ganglia back to the skin and the eruption of the lesions is referred to as the round trip theory of herpes pathogenesis. Back to our schematic, the persistence of herpes is in the ganglia in which it was transported to in the first place. It establishes latency there. This latency is mediated by a specific set of herpes viral genes. The viral genome becomes circular during this inactivity, and latency is maintained by T-cell mediated immunity. It's important to underscore that antiviral agents are not active against latent herpes virus. So if a person has acquired the virus and it's established latency, the viral infection is incurable. Back to our schematic, understanding what happens next is replication. The virus may reactivate from this site of latency, and it does so from time to time, and it does so uh, following several different kinds of stimuli, which could include stress, sun, menstrual cycle, a number of different stimuli. When the virus begins to reactivate, it goes from the circular state that it had in latency back to a linear state. The replication results in cell lysis, and the virus is now shed or excreted from the original site of infections. This shedding of virus may be associated with symptoms, or it may be asymptomatic. The frequency of reactivation varies markedly from individual to individual. Back to our schematic. After the virus has become replicating, it then has to get out or does get out of the host. And it may move to another host. And it does this by apposition of skin or mucous membranes. That spread from host to host is enhanced if there's skin damage in the susceptible individual. So if the person has burns or has a skin rash called eczema or a diaper rash, the virus being shed from a lesion or from a person, even if they don't have symptoms, may enter that damaged area, begin replicating, and the infection then begins in a new host. So understanding this cycle allows us to end with some points about the epidemiology of herpes infections. Herpes uh, only occurs, herpes simplex 1 and 2, only occurs in humans, the only reservoir. Because the infections once acquired are always with a person, the percentage of the population infected is cumulative. HSV-1 infections typically begin in early infancy, often with oral infections, and by the time one reaches adolescence age, 40 to 90 percent are infected. HSV-2, because it primarily spreads through sexual contact, starts later in life, and by the time one reaches adulthood, 20 to 30 percent of the population are infected. The rates of infection do vary to some degree according to geography, socioeconomic status, and race.